Hi all of you. Good evening. Uh, am I audible and am I visible to all of you? If that's the case, please show me a thumbs up. Show me a thumbs up in the live chat if I am audible and visible to you all. Hi, Webhav. If you can just show me a thumbs up if I am audible and visible. Thank you all. So, uh, as I can see from the live chat that I am audible and visible to you. Hi everyone, good evening. I'm Dr. Sakshi Rora Hans, a national level OBGY faculty. And today I am here not for any NEET exam, not for any FMG exam, but to help all those students who are going to appear for their MRCOG part two exam in July, right? Now uh, in MRCOG part two exam, uh, as you know, a lot of importance is there for the green top guidelines, for the nice guidelines and for TOG. So today I am here to discuss with you an important uh, topic which I have picked up from TOG and this TOG is uh, the volume is of January 2022 and the topic is investigation and management of post coital bleeding. So we'll be discussing management and the investigations in case of post coital bleeding. Along with that, towards the end of the session, I will also be discussing with you a set of some important MCQs, right? So I will be doing a couple of MCQs towards the end. Now, uh, this is the article which we are targeting, which we are going to understand that what the article says. So this is uh, from TOG 2022 January uh, edition, right? Now, first of all, it's important for us to understand what is post coital bleeding. And I'm sure all of you are uh, residents in OBGY. Some of you are practicing OBGY. So I don't need to tell you what is a post coital bleeding or a contact bleeding. It is any spotting or any non menstrual bleeding which occurs immediately after intercourse, right? Now, sometimes in your uh, R, uh, the uh, MRCOG exam, you might be asked important percentages. Questions based on percentages were important around three, four years back. Now the percentage of such questions have decreased, but still to be on the safer side, you should know that post coital bleeding, the incidence is 0.7 to 9%, right? Now, when we talk about causes of post coital bleeding, so they can be um, generally rather post coital bleeding is due to benign conditions, right? It could be due to urogenital atrophy, which is in India, we call it as the genito urinary syndrome and earlier it was called as senile vaginitis, right? So the term senile vaginitis has now been replaced by urogenital syndrome and here same thing is being referred to as urogenital atrophy. Then they can be, you know, any benign vascular tumors of the genital tract like hemangiomas or any AV malformations or endometrial polyp, cervical polyp, cervical ectropion, cervical endometriosis, which can lead to postcoital bleeding. Then another very important set of problems which can lead to postcoital bleeding is infections, right? This can be vulvovaginitis secondary to candidiasis or trichomonas. And I'm sure all of you know that in trichomonas, you get a red angry looking vagina or a strawberry vagina and patient may complain if there is severe infection patient may complain of PCB other than that cervicitis secondary to chlamydia or gonorrhea and endometritis can also lead to a PCB then you can have vulval lesions like lichen sclerosis genital warts genital ulcers syphilis all these can also lead to a uh, post-coital bleeding. Among malignancies, please understand 
that although PCB is considered as a cardinal symptom of cancer cervix, right? But the moment a patient comes to you with PCB, you are not going to make a diagnosis of postcoital bleeding, uh, of cancer cervix, right? It is one of the very important symptoms of cancer cervix, but then its predictive value is very less. A one very important question could be that how many patients who are coming to you with post-coital bleeding, what percentage of patients are actually going to have CIN? So the range is between 3 to 18 percent. Only 3 to 18 percent patients who are coming to you with complaint of post-coital bleeding eventually are having this post-coital bleeding due to CIN right? So one in malignancies, yes, definitely cervical cancer is amongst the top one, which we think about whenever we get a patient with postcoital bleeding. Then it could be vulval cancers, vaginal cancers, and rarely endometrial cancer. See, please understand all these points, which I'm telling you, they are from TOG. Nothing is, nothing has been added from my side, right? Now, postcoital bleeding usually arises from contact lesions which are there on cervix, vagina or vulva. When it comes to endometrial lesions, endometrial lesions usually lead to intermenstrual bleeding. But in most of your patients, postcoital bleeding and intermenstrual bleeding may coexist, right? But generally, PCB is because of the lesions which are there on cervix, on vagina or on vulva. And intermenstrual bleeding is because of the, lesion, the endometrial lesions, right? So endometrial cancer can lead to postcoital bleeding. Then uh, postcoital bleeding can also be due to any trauma, right? Or one of the very important things which you have to keep in your differential diagnosis whenever a patient of PCB comes to you is sexual abuse. So you have to, whenever you are taking history, this is again one of the differential diagnoses. or, you know, did this patient insert any foreign body? That is very important. These histories should be eliminated in all patients who are coming to you with postcoital bleeding. Another thing which we tend to forget and has been specifically mentioned here, and I'm so happy that it is mentioned here, is pregnancy-related bleeding. So whenever a patient of postcoital bleeding comes to you, right, and patient is of reproductive age, you should rule out pregnancy related complications, which may be a reason for atypical uterine bleeding and PCB is also an atypical uterine bleeding. And all of us know that whenever a patient of atypical uterine bleeding comes to us and she belongs to reproductive age, we have to rule out pregnancy in her. So same here, whenever a patient of PCB comes to you, postcoital bleeding, please do not forget to rule out pregnancy, especially in reproductive age females, right? Now, so how are we going to proceed? whenever a patient of postcoital bleeding comes to us. So first thing is history. You have to take a detailed history and because you know the various etiologies of postcoital bleeding, in your mind you are going to keep on ruling them all out by asking those specific questions. You have to take history for infections. You have to take history for any sexual abuse. You have to take history whether HPV immunization was done or not, right? Then please do not jump to per speculum examination after history. After history, do a per abdominal examination. Inspect the vulval skin as well. So local examination plays a very important role because when you are doing local examination, any vulval dermatosis which could be there, any excoriations which are there, any ulcers which are there, that they are the things which you have to note because again, these can lead to postcoital bleeding, right? And then comes per speculum examination, right? Now, in reproductive age females, as I told you, please do not forget to exclude pregnancy for any kind of atypical uterine bleeding. And PCB is a type of atypical uterine bleeding, right? And yes, uh, Tanya, 
This video will be available later on on the YouTube as well. Now, this flowchart over here is very important that what are you going to do when a patient of PCB comes to you and many a times on in your MCQs, this is the flowchart where they focus upon. So whenever a patient comes to you with postcoital bleeding, as I told you, the first thing which you have to do is you have to do take a very detailed history and you have to do a physical examination. Now, if uh, you are getting history of infections, right, if there is history of discharge, right, in that case, you have to be take you have to take out microbiology swabs. And what is the differential diagnosis which I'm keeping in mind? It could be cervicitis due to chlamydia. It could be cervicitis due to gonorrhea, right? So I am going to take vulvovaginal swab for NAT, that is nucleic acid amplification test for detecting chlamydia. I am going to take a vulvovaginal swab and an endocervical swab to detect gonorrhea, right? So that I rule out infections as a reason for postcoital bleeding. Now, every patient who's coming to you with postcoital bleeding, are you going to do a pap smear? No, you are not going to do a pap smear in every patient who comes to you with postcoital bleeding. You are going to do pap smear only if screening test is overdue, right? So, if her screening test is overdue, then I am going to do a pap test, a pap smear, and, then, and if I get abnormal result, then I am going to do a colposcopy. So postcoital patient coming to you with postcoital bleeding and they ask you what is the next step? Your next step is not cervical cancer screening. Please remember that. Your next step is history. Your next step is perspeculum examination, right? Your next step in every patient is not a cervical cancer screening and not colposcopy. Now, when you did a per speculum examination, if you saw that there is clinically abnormal cervix, what do I mean by clinically abnormal cervix? I mean if her cervix is friable or if I am seeing any ulcer in it or if I am getting any irregular mass I can see in the cervix, what am I suspecting? I am suspecting cancer cervix. So in that case, am I going to do a pap smear? No. On one side, I am getting a cardinal symptom of cancer cervix like PCB. And on the other hand, when I did a per speculum examination, I am also getting an abnormal cervix. So in this case, you are not going to do a per speculum examination. In this case, you are directly going to go for colposcopy. Right? Now, if suppose your patient's cervix is absolutely normal right but there is persistent postcoital bleeding or if there is coexisting intermenstrual bleeding now as i told you that rarely endometrial pathology can also present as postcoital bleeding so if i am getting persistent postcoital bleeding and the cervix is appearing absolutely normal, vulva, vagina, everything is absolutely normal, or if I am getting intermenstrual bleeding along with postcoital bleeding, in that case, I am going to do a transvaginal scan plus minus a pipel biopsy. A pipel biopsy means it either it can be written as a pipel biopsy or they can write it as endometrial biopsy or endometrial aspiration cytology. Any of these terms could be mentioned plus minus hysteroscopy, right? So this you are going to do only if there is persistent PCB, the cervix is appearing normal, or if there is PCB plus intermenstrual bleeding, because in this case, I am suspecting some endometrial pathology, right? But so I have told you, all the NEAT and FMG aspirants, this video is not for you. You are not supposed to know these guidelines. Please don't confuse yourself. Whatever I need to teach you, I teach you. And I tell you this is for NEAT, this is for FMGE. Please don't confuse yourself by attending this lecture. This is not meant for you, right? Now. Someone has written that I am not audible. Is it I am not audible? I 
am i not audible please let me know shweta has written that i am not audible am i audible or am i not audible please let me know in the chat box if you can tell me i am audible thank you so much for the heads up thank you great so shweta in that case you will have to check your connections please now now comes another very important thing that what is the indication for doing colposcopy so as i told you just now if you are getting post coital bleeding plus an abnormal looking cervix in that case that's an indication for doing colposcopy and the tog guidelines specifically mention that in this case the colposcopy should be done within 2 weeks right that is one indication number 2 just now we discussed that if you are getting excuse me an abnormal pap smear then that's an indication for doing colposcopy so as an indian practitioner these two things are indications for doing colposcopy in india as well right now these two are the ones which you have to learn additionally for your mrcog exam two sequential inadequate tests so if you have done two pap smears and the result is showing inadequate test or if cervix cannot be identified on per speculum examination then in that case you have to go for colposcopy right so there are in total four indications for doing colposcopy obviously if you are getting post coital bleeding plus an abnormally looking cervix you have to directly go for colposcopy which should be done within 2 weeks of this problem right number 2 abnormal screening test means that you have to go for colposcopy because colposcopy is a diagnostic test whereas paps and hpv dna testing are the screening tests right then if you are getting two sequential uh, inadequate tests then that's an indication for doing colposcopy or if cervix cannot be identified on per speculum examination then that's an indication for doing colposcopy right now further in tog guidelines they have mentioned that they have mentioned each lesion and what is the management of pcb in that particular condition right so the first condition which they have discussed is cervical ectropion now all those who don't understand what an ectropion means i'm just taking you quickly back to your anatomy right all of you know that in cervix there is an endocervix and there is an exocervix right exocervix is lined by squamous epithelium an endocervix is lined by columnar epithelium right now when we do a per speculum examination then we see the external loss and the pink area the pink part of the cervix which is visible to you right or on per speculum examination that is exocervix and as i told you exocervix is squam aligned by squamous epithelium now sometimes what happens is that endocervix which was found inside the cervix right this columnar epithelium which was found in the endocervix inside the cervix it comes out side right and endocervix is always red in color it's very friable it's red in color on per speculum examination so if you see this image over here this is normal cervix on per speculum examination and this over here image b is showing you ectropion ectropion means that now the columnar epithelium or the glandular epithelium has come on to the squamous epithelium right and now on per speculum examination that is also visible to you now this is absolutely physiological and when i teach my neat pg students also i tell them to remember that in which conditions is ectropion physiological it is the 3 p's 
Number one, at the time of puberty, it is physiological. Number two, during pregnancy, this happens and is physiological. And number three, with the use of pills. Which pills? With the use of oral combined pills. So when you are using estrogen and progesterone pill, then this happens. So basically, it is happening because of the estrogen component that the columnar epithelium comes outside and it lies around the external os right this is what is ectropion and because it is very friable it is fleshy that is why it can bleed also right so over here i have written this exposed columnar epithelium is susceptible to trauma and contact bleeding now if this is a physiological condition, how do you think you're going to manage it? Simply, you have to reassure your patient. You have to tell her that this is physiological in nature. And most of the patients, when you explain to them that this is physiological in nature, they will understand that no treatment should be given. And they will also opt for this, that I don't want any treatment for it. Another small thing which you can do is that if this ectropion has happened because of the use of an oral combined pill, instead of an OCP, you can shift your patient to progesterone only pill, right? Now, suppose there is persistent PCB because of ectropion. In that case, the option which you have is cryotherapy and diathermy. But then before you do cryotherapy or diathermy, you will have to explain to your patient that this is a recurrent condition, especially if she's on pills. This is a recurrent condition, which may happen even after you do cryotherapy or diathermy. One thing. Number two, you have to explain to them that the side effect or the disadvantage of doing cryotherapy uh, is that patient is going to have copious vaginal discharge till the time healing is complete and number three cervical stenosis may happen because of it right so inform your patient about all these things and if there is persistent bleeding you have to do cryotherapy or diathermy but then these things should be explained to the patient right so that was one thick cause of postcoital bleeding and i've told you that how to deal with it right uh just want to get a thumbs up from all of you that I hope you are understanding and the pace at which I am making uh, I am taking this lecture is okay with all of you because I do expect that you are knowing majority of the things it's just a revision for all of you all of you are either residents in OBGY or you are practicing OBGYs so I'm sure you, the basics are very clear to all of you So just let me know through the chat box that if the pace of the lecture is absolutely fine with you or not. Thank you, Simbu, Simu, for showing me a thumbs up. Okay. Thank you, Rohit. Great. So most of you are understanding and that's good. Now, a second reason for postcoital bleeding could be a cervical polyp. Cervical polyp, they are more frequently seen in perimenopausal females and in postmenopausal females. A polyp can be a cervical polyp. So it can arise either from endocervix or from exocervix or it can be an endometrial polyp. Management of polyp, all of you know, is very easy that if it is a cervical polyp, simply you have to avulse the polyp during a per speculum examination, right, using a polyp forceps. And if there is any bleeding, you have to apply silver nitrate. And because I want to exclude malignancy, that is why after you do a polypectomy, you have to send the polyp for histopathological examination, right? Now, if there is a large polyp, then in that case, you have to do polyspectomy with loop diathermy during colposcopy, right? That is how you manage a large cervical polyp. 
Now, when it comes to endometrial polyp, endometrial polyp can be associated with endometrial abnormalities like endometrial hyperplasias. And this is associated with endometrial abnormalities in 55% cases. So common sense tells me that I am going to do a polypectomy. I am going to do avulsion of the polyp. But along with that, I am going to do the you know the what is called as the gold standard method for assessing the endometrium and what is the gold standard method for assessing endometrium any endometrial pathology that is hysteroscopy and endometrial sampling so whenever there is an endometrial pathology please remember that for all endometrial pathologies the first investigation which you do is tbs right the investigation of choice is endometrial biopsy or endometrial aspiration cytology, which is an OPD procedure, which is done using a Pipel or a Vabra aspirator, right? And the gold standard investigation always is hysteroscopy and endometrial sampling. So whenever there is an endometrial polyp, because there are 55% chances that it could be associated with endometrial hyperplasia. So I will do avulsion of the polyp Plus, I am going to go for hysteroscopy and endometrial sampling because that is the gold standard method for assessing any endometrial pathology, right? Then, the other reason which we discussed that why postcoital bleeding could happen is cervicitis endometritis and PID you know these lesions can these uh, infections can also lead to postcoital bleeding so for chlamydia the test which you have to do is vulvovaginal swab or you can take urine and you can go for nucleic acid amplification test treatment for chlamydia is which has been recommended by RCOG and is given in TOG guidelines is azithromycin 1 gram oral followed by 500 mg once daily for two days right so you have to give azithromycin one gram single dose and then this has to be followed by 500 mg once daily for two days abstinence should be advised to the patient till treatment is complete and test of cure in case of chlamydia is not recommended right but this is not the case with gonorrhea in gonorrhea test of cure is recommended so let me come to that now, for diagnosing gonorrhea, you are going to take a vulvovaginal swab and an endocervical swab, and you are going to do nucleic acid amplification test. The treatment for gonorrhea, as recommended by TOG or by RCOG guidelines, are single dose 1 gram ceftriaxone, right? Test of cure is recommended in case of gonorrhea because in case of gonorrhea, recently we've started seeing a lot of species with antibiotic resistance. That is why a test of cure is recommended. In case of chlamydia, a test of cure is not recommended, right? In both chlamydia and gonorrhea, you should refer the patient to a local sexual health service for screening of other sexually transmitted infections and for pay partner notification, right? Because all these are sexually transmitted. Now, over here, I am also attached for you a screenshot of the treatment for PID which is recommended by RCOG. Once this session is over, PDF of today's session will be available on my Telegram channel. So if you have not joined the Telegram channel, please go and join just now. The name of the Telegram channel is MRCOG by Dr. Sakshi, right? So go and join MRCOG by Dr. Sakshi and today's uh, whatever I am teaching you, this PDF will be available on that telegram group. My second request to all of you is that please don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel and to my Instagram handle. Uh, on YouTube channel, I am going to post regularly some videos uh, related to TOG or to NICE guidelines or Green Top guidelines. And on Instagram also, I will be posting important updates, important stuff which you people need to know, right? So my Instagram handle is Dr. Sakshi Arora Hans. Uh, just let me check out. 
yeah that's dr sakshi aruna hans that is my instagram handle and please do not forget to press the bell icon for my youtube channel so that whenever a new video comes you are notified clear now now comes to the cause of which we were all waiting that i'm going to explain and that is cancer cervix and cin as i told you it is a cardinal symptom for cin and cancer cervix post coital bleeding but then it is has a very low predictive value and i also told you that in females who are coming to you with complaint of post coital bleeding the incidence of cin is 3 to 18% right now the screening guidelines what are the screening guidelines followed by rcog now the target age group for rcog is 25 to 64 years so for target age group for doing cancer cervix screening as recommended by rcog is 25 to 64 years now you till 50 years you are going to do screening after every 3 years and then you are going to do it after every 5 years so this is very different from what we do here in india what is recommended by who and by acog is very different you have to remember what is recommended by rcog that the screening the target population for screening is 25 to 64 years from starting from 25 years you have to do screening after every 3 years and up till 50 years it has to be after every 3 years beyond 50 years it has to be after every 5 years the only exception to this rule is patients who are hiv positive patients who are hiv positive in them you have to go for annual screening right so in that category of patients you are going to do annual screening now 70% of cancer cervix is due to hpv 16 and hpv 18 and that is the same thing which we also follow over here that 70 to 80% of cancers are due to hpv 16 and hpv 18 the other thing which rcog guidelines the tog mentions is that it is 70% of the females who in their lifetime are going to have hpv once most of the time see whenever your patient has hpv infection that doesn't mean she is going to have cancer all females who are who would have encountered hpv infection in their lifetime do not develop cancer cervix right because in majority of the females this hpv infection will clear automatically right the problem arises when this hpv infection persists it is the persistence of hpv which leads to cancer cervix now someone has asked me what is cancer what is the test of cure test of cure means that once your antibiotic regime is over you are an, again going to do the test to see whether the infection is present or not so again you are going to take a vulvo vaginal swab and again you are going to do nucleic acid amplification test that is what is called as test for cure so you are testing whether cure has happened or not right now HPV vaccination was included in Europe in 2008 and the HPV vaccine which is being used by them is Gardasil uh, and they are recommending two doses of Gardasil right irrespective of the age they are recommending two doses please remember again do not confuse if you are an OBGY resident and you are used to studying WHO sage guidelines this is not what WHO sage guidelines say when you are giving writing the exam for MRCOG you simply have to know guidelines which are relevant for RCOG or you have to know RCOG guidelines and you have to know the green top guidelines you are not going to base any of your answers based on WHO guidelines or our national guidelines or ACOG guidelines right so what is recommended by um, RCOG is that you have to give Gardasil and two doses of Gardasil and the age group which is recommended by RCOG is 12 to 13 years of age it is given to both boys and to girls 
Now, that is a common sense that why are you giving to girls? We know it is being given to prevent cancer cervix, then cancer vulva and cancer vagina. Why do you give it to boys? What are the cancers which HPV can lead to in boys? HPV can lead to oral cancers, penis cancers and anogenital cancers in males. That is why whenever we are giving HPV vaccine, we are not just giving HPV vaccine to girls, we are also giving to boys because in boys it can lead to three cancers, oral, penis and anogenital cancers, right? Now, how do you manage CIN? For management of CIN 1, if the management is you have to just follow them up for one year. Most of the cases when you follow them up for one year, the, the CIN will automatically regress, right? Now, if it is CIN 2 or CIN 3, in that case, you are going to do excision at the very first visit and that is what is called as C and treat. So once you see the problem is there, you are not going to delay it. In the first visit itself, you are going to treat it by excising it, right? An important drawback of excision is that when these females are going to conceive, then in their pregnancy, they can have preterm labor, right? So that's an important disadvantage of doing excision, right? Now, then vulval and vaginal lesions can lead to postcoital bleeding. For example, urogenital atrophy, as I told you, urogenital atrophy is nothing but another name for urogenital syndrome or senile vaginitis. So, obviously, this is seen in postmenopausal females and this is happening because of estrogen deficiency. So, there is going to be vaginal dryness and this vaginal dryness, because of the dryness patient may have postcoital bleeding right management of uh, this postcoital bleeding which is happening due to urogenital atrophy is you have to give vaginal lubricants apply vaginal lubricants or moisturizers then like you treat urogenital atrophy urogenital syndrome you can give topical estrogens or you can use selective estrogen receptor modulator drug or spemifin about uh, serms i just want to say that that most of the SERMs and you know that the most commonly serms which are used are clomiphene, tamoxifen, riloxifen. Most of the serms, their side effect is vaginal dryness and that is why you cannot use clomiphen, riloxifen or tamoxifen for treating this vaginal dryness or urogenital atrophy. It, they, this is the only uh, SERM or spemifen which doesn't lead to vaginal dryness and can be used as a treatment for vaginal dryness. Then other than that, you can use DHEA or you may go for laser treatment, right? So these are, this is if urogenital atrophy is causing postcoital bleeding. Then vulval dermatosis like lichen planus, lichen sclerosis and contact dermatitis can also lead to postcoital bleeding. And whenever a patient has lichen planus or lichen sclerosis or contact dermatitis, there is some common things which you have to tell them. Number one, you have to tell them to avoid any irritant, any vaginal irritant. So you will have to tell them to stop using soap for some time right? You are going to tell them to use vaginal lubricants and you are going to give some topical steroids to decrease the inflammation. Now, are you going to do biopsy of any uh, vulval area? So, vulval biopsy is indicated if there is a pigmented lesion or if there is an ulcerated lesion or if there is erosion present or if patient doesn't resolve or respond to treatment. So in case of pigmented lesions, uh, ulcerated lesions, wherever erosion is present, I am suspecting that it could be related to vaginal um, vulval intraepithelial neoplasias or vulval cancers. That is why in all these cases, I have to do a vulval biopsy, right? Now, if there is lichen sclerosis in your patient, Lichen sclerosis has 4 to 7% chances. 
In lichen sclerosis, there are 4 to 7 percent chances of developing squamous cell carcinoma. And that is why it is recommended that whenever you have a patient of lichen sclerosis, you have to call them annually for review, right? Like in uh, HIV positive patients, you were doing annual screening. Similarly, over here, if you have a patient with lichen sclerosis, you have to call them annually for review, right? Then comes vaginal cancers or vaginal intraepithelial neoplasias. Both these conditions rarely may lead to postcoital bleeding. And generally, these patients, the uh, patients who have vulval, who have vaginal intraepithelial neoplasias or vaginal cancers, most of them they are asymptomatic and they but where if they are symptomatic, they are going to come to you with complaint of vaginal discharge and PCB. That is the complaint with which they generally come to you. Most common complaint with which they come to you is vaginal discharge, right? Now, in case of vaginal intraepithelial neoplasias, they appear as white or red mucosal plaques. And in case of vaginal cancers, you are going to get ulcerated lesions, right? And these ulcerated lesions will be present on the upper one third of the posterior part of the vagina so they will be visible on the posterior wall of vagina in the upper one third portion most of the times vaginal cancer is located there you know if you're getting an ulcer because of vaginal cancer it will be located there in the posterior wall on the upper one third part right so whenever i'm suspecting vaginal cancers or i'm expect uh, suspecting vaginal intraepithelial neoplasias then that's an indication for doing biopsy right so this was all about postcoital bleeding uh, is there any question which you need to ask on postcoital bleeding this has totally the article the tog article on postcoital bleeding i have covered it completely for you any questions which you have Any questions which you ask, which you want to ask from the session? Any doubts? None? Okay. So if you don't have doubts, there are a few questions which we need to do. These questions are not related to postcoital bleeding, but they are related to gynae onco, right? So let's get going. A 65-year-old woman with BMI of 40. So number one, note the age of the patient. That is 65 years, right? Then your patient is having BMI 40, which means that your patient is an obese patient, right? So you have a patient who has BMI 40. Question further says that there is early menarche and late menopause. And there is type 2 diabetes. Now, all these things, they point towards endometrial cancer. These are risk factors for endometrial cancer. Endometrial cancer is related to increased hyperestrogenic conditions, right? So, whenever there is early menarche or late menopause, that means the female has been exposed to estrogen for a longer time and that itself is a risk factor for endometrial cancer. Not only this, obesity and diabetes are very important risk factors for endometrial cancer. There is something which is called as the corpus cancer syndrome. the corpus cancer syndrome corpus cancer syndrome means that your patient has hypertension diabetes and she is obese so there are increased chances of endometrial cancer in her 
right? So here also your patient is obese, she has diabetes and that is, I am thinking more in terms of endometrial cancer as of now. Now patient has come to you with postmenopausal bleeding. Again, one of the symptoms which is, which indicates endometrial cancers, right? The exit cervical cytology was normal. She previously had a cone biopsy and is known to have cervical stenosis. An ultrasound scan reveals an endometrial thickness of 20 millimeters, which means her endometrium is very, very thick. Now, whenever in your postmenopausal females, you have thick endometrium. Right, which means endometrium is more than equal to 5 millimeters thick on TVS, then that's an indication for doing endometrial biopsy. Right, so in this case, because endometrium is 20 millimeters thick, and as it is, she has so many risk factors for endometrial cancer. Logically, it tells me that I should be doing after an ultrasound, I have to go for endometrial biopsy. Right. And as I told you, endometrial biopsy or endometrial aspiration cytology, whatever you want to call it as, is done in OPD using a pipel. So over here, both pipel biopsy in clinic and general anesthesia, hysteroscopy and biopsy were unsuccessful. So please understand that uh, the, as I told you, for endometrial lesions, the investigation of choice is endometrial biopsy or endometrial aspiration cytology. But the gold standard investigation is fractional curettage and hysteroscopy. And one of the indications for doing fractional uh, curettage and hysteroscopy is when, uh, you know, there is cervical stenosis. Whenever there is cervical stenosis, I'm going to give general anesthesia to my patient and then I am going to do hysteroscopy and biopsy in order to know how the endometrium is, right? I will also take out sample and send it for histopathological examination. Now, your question is saying that both pipel biopsy in the clinic and general anesthesia, hysteroscopy and biopsy were unsuccessful due to cervical stenosis. What further step would you discuss with the woman? Now, some of you are saying option F. Already your question is saying that you are unable to do hysteroscopy and biopsy because of cervical stenosis. Then why do you want to repeat it again? Quickly tell me, what are you going to advise to your patient now? You can't do hysteroscopy and biopsy, uh, hysteroscopy and fractional curettage or hysteroscopy and biopsy you are unable to do. Patient is coming to you with postcoital bleeding. Patient is 65 years old, which is again one of the age group which favors endometrial cancer. Plus, she has so many risk factors for endometrial cancer. So, isn't it wise to tell her to undergo hysterectomy and bilateral salpingo oophorectomy? Right? What is the role of MRI in endometrial cancer? Role of MRI in endometrial cancer is it helps you in knowing how much of the myometrium is involved, right? So in this case, I am not going to tell her that please let's go for MRI. I am going to tell her you are in that age group where, uh, you know, endometrial cancer is common. You have all the risk factors for uh, endometrial cancer. Plus, hysteroscopy and biopsy are unsuccessful because of cervical stenosis. So, best thing for you to do is that please uh, give me consent or think about hysterectomy and bilateral sampingo oophorectomy, right? MRI, as I am telling you, Shantanu, it doesn't play much role in endometrial cancer because it just helps you in knowing how much of the myometrium is involved. Right? So, over here, 
I have just listed down some important investigations which you do in case of endometrial cancers. All of you know endometrial cancer is endometroid variety and non-endometroid variety. Now, when it is an endometroid variety, you are going to go for a staging laparotomy, right? And uh, as I told you, the uh, invest the gold standard investigation is hysteroscopy and biopsy, uh, hysteroscopy and fractional curettage. In non-endometroid varieties of cancers, you should do a chest X-ray. In non-endometroid variety of cancers, you should go for, uh, you know, uh, transvaginal ultrasound, right? So, oh, sorry, CT scan. So, you have to go for a chest X-ray and CT scan in non-endometroid variety of cancers. These are the investigations which you do in non-endometroid variety other than hysteroscopy and fractional curettage. As far as MRI is concerned, MRI, as I told you, it helps in knowing how much of myometrium is involved, right? So, if I want to know how much of the myometrium is involved, then I am going to go for MRI. Right? Okay. Now, next question. Claudia is a 19-year-old girl without a significant past medical history and she has been diagnosed and treated for yolk sac tumor. Which tumor marker would be the most appropriate to use for her follow-up? Right? Now, when it comes to ovarian tumors, in ovarian tumors, many questions are asked in different ways related to tumor markers and to histopathological examination findings, right? Now, when we are talking about tumor markers for ovarian cancer, uh, it is not just important that which tumor marker is seen uh, or tested in which ovarian cancer the other important thing which you need to know is which tumor marker is not tested in that particular ovarian cancer right so which tumor markers are tested that is important to know and in that particular ovarian cancer which tumor marker will never be raised in that particular cancer that is all the more equally important to know right so please remember that whenever Whenever a female of childbearing age comes to you with ovarian mass, then you have to check CA125 levels in her. You have to check HCG, alpha fetoprotein and LDH levels with her, right? So you have to check her CA125, alpha fetoprotein, LDH and HCG in her whenever a female of childbearing age comes to you with ovarian mass right so uh, coming to the tumor markers i have made a list of important things over here i have made in this table i have written down what is the tumor marker which is raised in that particular ovarian cancer and what is a tumor marker which is never raised in that particular ovarian cancer and histopathological examination findings so the first type of ovarian cancer it could be epithelial cancer that's the most common variety and in epithelial it is the serous type of ovarian cancer which is the most common right and in the tumor marker which you do test in this category of ovarian cancer is ca125 and histopathological examination finding is a samoma body then comes mucinous variety. In mucinous variety, the tumor marker becomes CA99. And there is no typical histopathological examination finding for mucinous variety of uh, epithelial cell tumors. The only thing which you have to remember is that mucinous cyst adenoma as well as mucinous cyst adenocarcinoma, whether it is benign or whether it is malignant, it can lead to pseudomyxoma peritoneum, where in the entire peritoneum you get a gelatinous material, right? Then third, we are going to talk about the germ cell tumors. In germ cell tumors, the first one is dysgerminoma. 
नाउ यहां पे द कंफ्यूजन अराइजेस क्योंकि डिसजर्मिनोमा योक सैक ट्यूमर टेरेटोमा राइट एंड कोरियो कार्सिनोमा वॉट आर द ट्यूमर मार्कर विच आर रेज इन दिस कैटेगरी एंड विच ट्यूमर मार्कर इज नॉट रेज इन दिस कैटेगरी दैट इज इंपॉर्टेंट नाउ डिस जर्मिनोमा का मतलब है दैट इज हाउ आई मेक माई नीट पी जी स्टूडेंट्स रिमेंबर डिस जर्मिनोमा इज अ ट्यूमर विच इज सीन इन डिस जेनेटिक गुनाइट्स अब मुझे बताओ एनी मेल हु हैज डिस जेनेटिक गुनाइट्स विल यू कॉल देम एज एल्फा मेल्स नो दे कैन नेवर बी एल्फा मेल्स so this germinoma me one tumor marker which will never be raised is alpha fetoprotein that's how you have to remember it that in case of this germinoma alpha fetoprotein is never raised right i shouldn't be saying but i'm just that is how i make them remember ki this genetic gonads hai kisi male ke paas so that's a very ls thing so l right so that means the main tumor marker which is raised in this germinoma is ldh right other than that you may get hcg or you may not get hcg you may get placental alkaline phosphatase raised or you may not get right so again i am repeating this germinoma may a tumor marker which you never get is alpha that is alpha fetoprotein ls kind of males so you are going to get ldh and the ones which are plus minus are the remaining that is uh, hcg will be plus minus placental alkaline phosphatase will be plus minus right now this germinoma may when you do histopathological examination you are going to get a nest of cells which are separated by a fibrous septa and this fibrous septa is infiltrated by lymphocytes right so nest of cells just now i'll show you a histopathological examination finding see over here this is the histopathological examination finding of a dis germinoma so you are getting a nest of cells can you see all these nest of cells these nest of cells are separated by a fibrous septa and lymphocytes will be infiltrating this fibrous septa right this is the histopathological finding which you get in case of dis germinoma right then comes your yolk sac tumor which is also called as endodermal sinus tumor ab yolk sac tumor mein kaise yaad rakhenge yolk sac is y right that means xy individual xy individual are alpha individuals right and because they are alpha individuals they will have alpha fetoprotein as their main markers and because they are alpha individuals will they have any kind of female hormone no so hcg is negative in them you never get hcg positive in yolk sac tumor the one tumor marker which you always get is alpha the one which you don't get is hcg ldh is plus minus right now in case of yolk sac tumor the uh, the histopathological finding which you get is a schiller dual body and this schiller dual body may you are getting a central capillary you are going to see a red color central capillary which is surrounded by tumor cells so you can see here this red color capillary was surrounded by these purple colored tumor cells and then you had this white area surrounding the tumor cells that is the cystic spaces this entire thing is called as a schiller dual body right this is what you get in yolk sac tumor then comes your teratomas now in teratomas we have mature teratoma that is a dermoid cyst and immature teratoma immature teratoma is like yolk sac tumor that is may be you are not going to get and never are you going to get hcg in immature teratoma and alpha fetoprotein ldh plus minus right then comes choriocarcinoma choriocarcinoma may all of you know that hcg will always be present rest of the two will be absent then comes granulosa cell tumor granulosa cell tumor granulosa cell itself secretes estrogen and inhibin b so they become the tumor marker that inhibin b estrogen are the tumor markers for granulosa cell tumor not inhibin uh, estrogen estrogen is not a tumor marker inhibin b is the tumor marker it is an estrogen secreting tumor right 
and when you do histopathological examination you get cal exner body and coffee bean nuclei now how does cal exner body look like it appears as if the entire slide is full of follicles right so if you see that the entire slide is full of follicle like structures then that means you are looking at a granulosa cell tumor because those follicle like structures are nothing but cal exner bodies Krukenberg tumor is a metastatic tumor of the ovary and in Krukenberg tumor the histopathological finding which you get is signet ring cells so over here you have see here what do you understand by signet ring cells signet ring cells means mucin filled cells that means these white cells and the nuclei are pushed to the periphery do you see all these nuclei are pushed to periphery so mucin laden cells with nuclei pushed to one side or to the periphery giving the appearance or ring like appearance right so this is a signet ring cell which is a histopathological landmark for krukenberg tumor right now so over here your question was uh we were doing this question ha huh? so this question this was the same this is the same question so she has been diagnosed and treated for yolk sac tumor okay so yolk sac tumor hai so what what uh, is the most appropriate tumor marker to be used for follow up yolk sac ka matlab alpha male and that means it is alpha fetal protein right so it is option a coming to the next question so over here the next question says that claudia is a 19 year old girl without significant past medical history and has been diagnosed and treated for dysgerminoma which tumor marker would be most appropriate to use for follow up so tell me in dysgerminoma what is the most tum important tumor marker which you are going to check so i'm waiting so that the lag is over and you can tell me the answers so in the comment uh, in the chat box please write the answers excellent doctor wonder woman so yes uh, simbu shant the no all of you are telling me correctly it is ldh right now third question a 28 year old woman presents to antenatal clinic at 14 weeks pregnancy with mild lower abdominal pain and frequency in micturition on ultrasound there is a solid adenexal mass her ldh and hcg levels are raised which of the following tumor is most likely cause for her symptoms so in which tumor number 1 she is pregnant so first of all think in pregnancy which is the most common ovarian tumor which you get right malignant ovarian tumor number 2 a second thing which they have told you is that ldh is raised and hcg is raised so you have to tell which one aisha you are saying d simbu is saying a mithu a wonder woman a good most of you are answering it correctly just now i told you it is a dysgerminoma in which ldh and hcg are raised so whenever you get a combination of ldh and hcg you have to think about dysgerminoma number 1 number 2 in case of pregnancy the most common benign ovarian tumor which you get is a dermoid cyst and dermoid cyst is a mature teratoma right but the most common malignant tumor ovarian tumor which you get during pregnancy is dysgerminoma so the answer over here is option a dysgerminoma over here in this slide i have written a few important points related to dysgerminoma i will be sharing this pdf with you 
this has got all those important points from RCOG guidelines which you need to know. For example, the remember that the recurrence rate of a disgerminoma and the bilaterality in a disgerminoma both are 15 to 20 percent, right? Disgerminoma is a germ cell tumors and germ cell tumors are mostly unilateral, right? But it is this dysgerminoma which has the highest incidence of bilaterality in a germ cell tumor and the incidence of bilaterality in dysgerminoma is 15 to 20 percent, right? Now, it is the most common ovarian cancer to happen in dysgenetic gonads. It is the, now, if they ask you most common ovarian cancer to happen in uh, dysgenetic gonads, then it is dysgerminoma. But if they ask you most common ovarian tumor, right, which could be benign, which could be malignant, in case of dysgenetic gonads, then the answer is gonadoblastoma, right? Then it is the only ovarian tumor which is radiosensitive, and, but its management remains chemotherapy. Now, when you look at the specimen of dysgerminoma, grossly, it, its cut surface is very fleshy, solid, lobulated, and it is tan in color. So, it's a solid tumor, which is fleshy, lobulated, and has a tan color, right? Histopathological finding, just now we did for a dysgerminoma. Clear? Now, look at this question. A cyst is seen for histological investigation and the report shows insular pattern of round uniform cells with 80% neurosecretory granules. Patient has also had 5 HIAA in her urine sample. Which of the following cyst? I'm sure all of you will answer this correctly. So which amongst the following will have neurosecretory granules and is going to secrete 5-HIAA? Clear cell tumor, dermoid cyst, immature teratoma, ovarian carcinoid or struma ovari. So it has to be an ovarian carcinoid, right? So remember, ovarian carcinoid tumors are uncommon and they are considered to be germ cell in origin. Primary ovarian carcinoid should be treated as an ovarian tumor of low malignant potential. A 24 hours excretion of 5 HIAA more than 25 milligrams provides a strong evidence for the diagnosis of carcinoid syndrome. Right? Now look at this question over here. An 18-year-old girl presents with a large abdominal mass with abdominal pain. She claims the mass has increased in size within the last three months. It's a rapidly growing mass. A leprotomy and unilateral salpingo-oophorectomy is performed. Histology shows mesodermal core with a central capillary, that is Schiller dual body. At the moment, they say Schiller dual body, the diagnosis becomes very um, easy. That means they're talking about yolk sac tumor or endodermal sinus tumor. Over here, please listen from the history also. I was thinking about yolk sac tumor because yolk sac tumor patients, they present either to you as a case of acute abdomen or, you know, yolk sac tumor is a very rapidly growing tumor. So any ovarian tumor which is rapidly growing, I'm going to think about yolk sac tumor. The other thing which I point to point out to all of you is that whenever ovarian cancers are happening in young females and in young females, it is the germ cell tumors which most commonly happen. So whenever you are treating ovarian cancers for staging purpose, you do not do a hysterectomy in them. In young females, in germ cell tumors, I don't do a hysterectomy. In young females, in uh, germ cell tumors, as just now I told you, most of the germ cell tumors are unilateral, right? So we go for unilateral salpingo oophorectomy, right? So that is why in this patient also a unilateral salpingo oophorectomy was done, right? So over here, I have written down for you people some important points related to uh, yolk sac tumor and endodermal sinus tumor. All this PDF will be available to you on my telegram channel. You can go through this, right? Then, 
An eight-year-old girl presents with symptoms and signs of precocious puberty. Which of the following tumors should not be included in differential diagnosis? Right? So you have to please read your question very carefully. They are saying which of the following tumors should not be included in differential diagnosis? Tell me quickly. I'm waiting for your answers. Okay, uh, your answers have started coming. Okay, just one answer I've got. Confusing question. Okay. Shantanu has given me the answer as option C. Anyone else? Okay. So understand. Precocious puberty is going to happen from which variety of tumors? It is going to happen from sex cord tumors right because sex cord tumors will be secreting hormones right so they will be secreting estrogen so all the sex cord tumors can lead to your precocious puberty so in sex cord tumors we have embryonal cancer we have granulosa cell tumor and polyembryoma right so these are your sex cord tumors now I am left with two options, choriocarcinoma and endodermal sinus tumor. Now choriocarcinoma secretes HCG just now we saw and the alpha subunit of HCG is similar to alpha subunit of LH and FSH, right? That is why a choriocarcinoma patient may present to you as precocious puberty right but never will endodermal sinus tumor present to you as precocious puberty because that's a germ cell tumor right clear to all of you so the answer over here is going to be option c that is endodermal sinus tumor so in the differential diagnosis i am never going to keep endodermal sinus tumor clear to all of you Yes, hardly matters if you people did it wrong. There is no need to, uh, you know, retract your messages. At least you attempted. And now when I have told you uh, what you did wrong, you will remember this, right? So it's okay. Now, next, you are reading the histology report of a patient who had a leprotomy for an abdominal mass. A biopsy was taken as the mass was deemed to be inoperable. The histology report showed a tumor with appearance of mucin-filled epithelial cells, signet ring cells. Which of the following organs is most likely origin of the primary cancer? So first of all, tell me what is your diagnosis? Which is the uh, ovarian cancer which is happening here? First tell me the diagnosis and then we'll come to this question. Which ovarian tumor are they talking about? First, tell me which ovarian tumor are they talking about? A, B, C, D, bhul jau. First, only the ovarian tumor they are talking about. They are talking about Krukenberg tumor right because just now we did that in Krukenberg tumor you get signet ring cells now what is a Krukenberg tumor a Krukenberg tumor is metastatic tumor of the ovary and most common site from where metastasis come the primary source of cancer is stomach right so most often from the pyloric end of the stomach via retrograde lymphatics this cancer comes and metastasizes to the ovary and that is what is called as Krukenberg tumor. So stomach is the most common primary cancer from where Krukenberg tumor arises and the most common root of spread is retrograde lymphatics. Please do not answer it as transylomic, right? 
there are two uh, routes retrograde lymphatic and transylomic but the most common route through which it is going to come will be retrograde lymphatics now the other primary cancers could be in gi or breast cancer and krukenberg tumor can arise from them also but the most common is stomach krukenberg tumor is bilateral it is in 80% cases it will lead to symmetrical enlargement of the ovary it is vaccine consistency it is mobile the shape of the ovary is retained and the capsule remains intact right so these are characteristics of krukenberg tumor it's a very waxy kind of a tumor right so this is uh, the signet ring cells which appear on histopathological examination so the answer to this question will be option e transylomic root aisha is there but that's not the most common root of spread most common root of spread is retrograde lymphatics so from the pyloric end of the stomach via retrograde lymphatics it comes to the ovary clear to all of you so that brings me to the end of this session i hope all of you have understood this session and uh, if i get uh, you know encouragement from you people in terms of please let me know in the comment section whether the class was okay for you all or whether you didn't like the class your positive and negative comments are always welcome and please do not uh, forget to subscribe the channel so if i am in you know if you people are understanding the classes then i will continue taking classes like these and the timing will always be towards the 10 o'clock or towards 10:30 so that once you finished your entire day then before going to sleep you can study a topic from me right so uh thank you all take care good night